so we might as well get started. Uh, let me say a few things, then I'll open us in prayer. Thank you for coming. And if this is, I'm curious, if this is your first time to attend an Ember lecture, do you mind just raising your hand? We won't embarrass you. I'm just curious. Right on. Fantastic. Glad to have you. So if you're new, here's what you need to know. Uh, these take a while, so we'll be here for, I'm going to guess, about an hour, 45 minutes. With that being said, if you need to go to the restroom or you need to go get a sip of water or take a phone call, you just come and go as you please. Uh, one time I had someone begging me for bathroom breaks. I thought, well, we'll never get the train back on the rails if we have a bathroom break, so just take your own bathroom breaks, and uh, we're just going to go right on through. And we're going to be giving away uh, plenty of books all month. So I'm very, very excited about that. Um, and let me also explain this. What I am doing tonight is telling the story of the Pentateuch. So all month, we're going to focus on the Pentateuch, which is a word representing the first five books of the Bible. Tonight, I'm telling the story. Now, I feel like I need to explain. Uh, some people have certain expectations of stories. So when I tell a story, uh, I often don't include as much detail as other people when they tell stories. And so I'm probably going to hit the, the middle road here. If When I say I'm telling the story of the Pentateuch, if you have an expectation for lots of exquisite details and all this stuff, you may be a little bit disappointed. Uh, we've only got so much time. I'm going to try to tell a story of the first five books of the Bible in one session. So just kind of think summary. In the sense, what I did, if you, if you open up your Bible and see most of your copies of Scripture probably have the passages broken into sections with little titles in the section. Uh, what I did is I went through my ESV Scriptures and I used those titles to just build a bit of an outline and then I fleshed it out. Okay, so it's sort of a summary story of the Pentateuch. So listen, with that being said, let's get into it. I will, uh, I will Spend several minutes starting this story, then I'll call a timeout, we'll give some books away, then we'll jump back into it, we'll just do that back and forth. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the gift of being able to gather here, uh, to think about your word. Lord, I thank you that um, we have an opportunity to slow down compared to normal. And so, Lord, I ask right now for, for all of us that we would be able to savor as much as we can of the opportunity that we have to, to listen to a summary of the Pentateuch, to think about your word, and just to be pondering how it informs our faith. So, God, I pray you use this time for the sake of your church, for your glory. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'm going on airplane mode. All right, there we go. Okay, let me just begin reading a story of the Pentateuch. And at times I'll encourage you to turn to passages of Scripture with me. In the very beginning of time, God created the heavens and the earth. With the power of His Word, He created light and separated light from darkness. He separated waters from waters, creating a sky. He separated water from dry ground. He created vegetation. He created the sun and moon and stars. He created fish and birds and bugs and mammals. And it was all good. Then it got even better. God created mankind. He created them male and female. They fit together so well that through their joining, God could create more humans whom he charged to fill and subdue the earth. He created them in his image, which means in ways unlike any other aspects of creation, the man and the woman could know one another and know God. And it was very good, and God rested. God put the man and the woman in a beautiful garden called Eden. They had a beautiful relationship with one another and a beautiful relationship with God. But the serpent came, and the serpent doubted and distorted God's word, and he deceived the woman and the man into disobeying God's law. They ate fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. After being deceived, they were disillusioned. 
They learned the difference between good and evil, but not in the way they had so naively expected. Immediately they felt shame. They hid their bodies from one another, and they hid themselves from God. But God found them, and he explained to them the consequences of their disobedience. Both would endure pain in their most natural callings, the man while he worked the land, and the woman while she bore children. Then God cursed the serpent and explained to him the ultimate consequences of his rebellion. The serpent was the lowest of all the creatures. He would crawl on his belly all his days. There would always be enmity between his offspring and the offspring of the woman. The offspring of the woman, her seed, her son, would one day deal a fatal blow to the serpent. God removed Adam and Eve from Eden for their own good. In this new situation where the world was fallen under sin, Adam and Eve had sons, Cain and Abel. They grew up to be men. In a jealous rage, Cain killed Abel. The effects of sin proved to be immediate and drastic and deadly. Yet there was some joy brought into the world as Eve gave birth to another son named Seth. Overall, things did not seem to get better. The more people populated the earth, the more corrupt the earth became. You may want to turn to Genesis chapter 6 real quick. Let me read a passage and you can follow along. Go ahead and find Genesis 6 verse 5. We see that the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Let me say here, I realize some of you, you like handouts with fill in the blanks. All right, Lord willing, those are coming next week. Okay, just so you know. Tonight, it's us and scripture. Things got so bad that God decided to destroy the human population, but he did not destroy them totally. He preserved a man and his family. The man was Noah whose name sounds like the Hebrew word for relief. God told Noah to build an ark to survive a flood. God wiped away the entire human population and the entire land animal kingdom with his flood, all except those he spared within the ark. And when the flood was over, God started again. God made a covenant with Noah explaining that he would never again destroy completely the earth with water. God allowed the human population to grow. But just as previously, the more the human population grew, the more corrupt the earth became. People could not overcome their own pride. And in direct opposition to God's demands, they refused to spread throughout the earth. They decided to work together and build a tower that they thought would give them a name for themselves. God knew that this would not be a healthy situation for them, so he came down and examined their tall tower and confused their language so they could no longer work together, and he scattered them throughout the earth. And then God again chose one man, whose family would be used to preserve the world from total destruction. He called Abram, whose name means exalted father. He told Abram to go where he would show him. You may want to turn to chapter 12 briefly. These are very famous passages of scripture. I read these quite a bit. God promised Abram in chapter 12, beginning in verse 2, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Abram and his wife Sarai obeyed God's calling and believed his promises, which took a tremendous amount of faith, for they were barren. They traveled to the land of Canaan, where God promised to give that land to their offspring. Because of a famine, they found themselves in Egypt. Then they returned to Canaan, sojourning with Abraham's nephew, Lot. Eventually, Abram and Lot experienced so much prosperity that the land could not contain both of their families and their livestock, so Abram and Lot separated. Lot chose to move to Sodom, 
Abram was able to settle in Canaan. In Canaan, God made a covenant with Abram. God told him that he would have a son, an heir. In fact, God said Abram's offspring would be like the stars in the sky. But Abram would have to wait a really long time. Abram and Sarai were already old. They were waiting so long that Sarai herself suggested that Abram have a child through her servant, Hagar. Abram agreed. And with Hagar had a son named Ishmael. But Abram had to keep waiting for Sarai to have a child. God explained more about the covenant that he was making with Abram. He explained that he would now be called Abraham, which is a name that means father of a multitude. And he would have to keep the covenant of circumcision, which is a sign that would identify God's people as belonging solely to him. Furthermore, God reiterated his promise that Abraham would have a son through Sarah. Eventually, the day came when Sarah conceived a child, and at the age of 90, she would give birth to a son, just as God had promised. This son's name was Isaac, which means something like he laughs. Several years after fulfilling his promise of Isaac, God did the unthinkable. God commanded Abraham again to go to a place that he would show him. This time, when he got there, he would have to sacrifice his only son. Abraham obeyed. He journeyed three days with Isaac. He tied Isaac to an altar. He lifted his blade, and he heard the voice of the angel of the Lord. Isaac was spared. A ram was provided. Abraham's faith was vindicated. God's love for Abraham and commitment to his covenant promises were affirmed. Isaac grew up, and under God's providence, he found his wife, Rebekah. They had two sons, Esau and Jacob. As Esau and Jacob grew up, they did not get along much better than Cain and Abel. One day, in a moment of irrational hunger, some of you know what that feels like, Esau allowed himself to be swindled by Jacob. And he sold to Jacob his own birthright in exchange for a bowl of stew. Jacob became the firstborn by legal right through his deception of Esau. Later, Jacob would steal again from Esau. With the help of his strategic mother, Jacob tricked Isaac into switching Esau's blessing with him. And Jacob then went on the run. Under God's providence, Jacob would meet the family of Laban. Jacob met his match in Laban. Laban could deceive with the best of them. Some of you may know, you may remember the details of this story. For 14 years, Jacob worked for Laban in order finally to secure Laban's daughter Rachel as his wife. But he at first had to marry Rachel's older sister, Leah, when Laban tricked him. Eventually, with Leah, Rachel, and their two maid servants, Jacob eventually fathered 12 sons. Jacob prospered. He acquired so much, he knew that it would, time, it would be time for him to leave, so he fled with his family from Laban. Jacob was fleeing from one man, knowing that he would have to confront another man, his brother Esau. On the way, Jacob was confronted by the angel of God. He wrestled with God during the night and limped away from the experience That night, God renamed Jacob. God gave him the name Israel because he had striven with God. Jacob eventually met Esau, who expressed mercy and grace and love. Jacob had a favorite son. His name was Joseph. He was Rachel's firstborn. He was the 11th of the 12. And his older brothers were very jealous of him because it was obvious that Jacob was playing favorites. Joseph had dreams that predicted his family would bow down to him. When he shared those dreams, his brothers hated him even more. They hated him so much, they were willing to sell him into slavery down to Egypt. Joseph endured slavery and oppression in Egypt for years. He was essentially forgotten. 
Nevertheless, God was with Joseph. He would prosper in his slavery to the point where he would oversee the household of his master Potiphar. However, Potiphar's wife lusted after Joseph, but he refused her advances. So she framed him for attempted rape, and Joseph was thrown into the dungeon. But even in the dungeon, the Lord was with Joseph. Joseph kept prospering. And as the Lord would see fit, two of the king's servants, the cupbearer and the baker, were thrown into the same prison with Joseph. One night, they had troubling dreams that they could not interpret. Joseph was able to interpret the dreams for them. He promised the cupbearer that he would be restored to his role as cupbearer. He promised the baker that he would be beheaded. Both of those interpretations came true, but Joseph was still forgotten until two years later. Pharaoh himself had a dream that he could not understand. Pharaoh saw seven fat cows eaten up by seven skinny cows. Then he saw seven full ears of corn eaten up by seven thin ears of corn. None of the Egyptian magicians or wise men could interpret the dream for Pharaoh. Joseph was finally remembered by the cupbearer. So they called Joseph to interpret for Pharaoh. Joseph explained to Pharaoh that Egypt would have seven years of plenty. And during those seven years, it would be wise for Pharaoh to save up resources. Because after the seven years of plenty, there would be seven years of famine. And things turned out just as Joseph said. Pharaoh raised Joseph up to second in command over all of Egypt. The slave had become the ruler. All the known world suffered from the famine. The famine was so severe that even Joseph's family in Canaan, the promised land, needed to find food. So Israel sent his sons to Egypt. Without recognizing him, they had to present themselves to Joseph. He recognized them, however. He treated them like spies and sent them back to Canaan to get their youngest brother, Benjamin. He kept one of their brothers, Simeon, in prison until they returned. They eventually returned with Benjamin. After testing them even more, Joseph eventually revealed his identity to his brothers. He showed love towards them and expressed his desire to reconcile with them and instructed them to return to get Jacob, their father, and bring the entire family back. Israel came down to Egypt. And right at this point, we are right at just before the ending of Genesis, which feels like a fantastic time for some giveaways. Do we have some names right? All right. Okay, y'all bear with me. I've got to get my instructions here on what color is which group of people. All right. Pink. I'm going to guess this is for women. Okay, pink is women. Y'all help me remember that. Yellow is small group leaders. Blue is everybody else. Okay, are you all in the mood to get some books? Okay, how many books do you have in your library? Nowhere near enough. That's always the answer, okay? Praise the Lord. Okay, so let's give away some books. All right, so I am going to just start pulling some names, and kind of as I, as I give a book away, I'll explain what it is. All right, let me see. I'm going to give one of these green books away right here. Now, if you are... Uh, a small group leader, teacher of the church, and you received one of these books. Do you mind raising your hand? All right. I just want to say thank you for your teaching ministry. Everybody else, would you mind showing appreciation for your Sunday school and small group leaders? <laughs> Absolutely. So this is, this is a book that we gave them at the end of this last year. And so these books are going to go to everybody else. It's a book called Sound Doctrine. And the subtitle, some of you may remember that it's all about the subtitle when it comes to books, okay? It's how a church grows in the love and holiness of God. Again, it's called Sound Doctrine. The author's name is Bobby Jameson. Uh, it is part of the Nine Marks brand, which is a wonderful uh, publish, uh, publishing brand of books. And this particular copy is going to increase the library of Woody Wagers. And I assume, Junior... All right. Come on down, Woody. I'm going to go ahead and uh, grab another name here. I'm going to crumple your name up disrespectfully and just throw it to the side so you don't get another one. All right. Thank you, sir. Congratulations. 
All right, this copy of Sound Doctrine is going to go to Rhonda Rivera. Where is Rhonda? All right, here she comes. I'll meet you halfway while I crumple your name. Congratulations. Let's see here. By the way, I don't have much of a plan for this. We're just going to give away books all month until we don't have any more. Uh, let's do a couple booklets. Who likes small books? Let me be honest. I, sometimes I just love a nice small book. Well, this is a booklet. Uh, this is probably about as long as what I'm reading to you guys tonight. This is a book called, What Should I Look For in a Church? Okay, listen, I want us to think about things like that. Just had a a membership class start this morning. I want us to think about the kind of things we should look for in a church. Uh, it is part of a series called Church Questions. This one is written by Alex Duke. And let's see, I'll pull from uh, one of the leadership piles here. And uh, this book is going to go to the library of Kathy Sims. I saw you come in. Where you... All right. You are welcome. And then we'll give one more copy of What Should I Look For in a Church to Marion Miller. Saw you right over here. I'll bring it to you. Congratulations. All right, let's see what else I want to give away. Y'all know some of the bigger ones. You're going to have to wait for those. Uh, this here, this is a book called Praying the Bible. Uh, by Donald Whitney. This book, every once in a while, uh, Crossway Publishing gives churches free sets of books. And uh, I don't know if Kyle, Kyle, are you in here? Kyle's not in here, but Kyle Huntsinger somehow, I don't know how I don't receive these emails, but he does. So he knows when publishing companies are just giving away books, and he's always good to get our church a stack. So I don't know if you can tell up here, but this, there, there's a stack over here and a stack over there. Uh, these were all just given to us free. Again, this is called Praying the Bible by Donald Whitney. And this one is going to go to Diane Emetis. All right. There you go. And uh, we'll have to give away several of these. Let's see. I got to. All right. I took one from that side. So I got to take one from this side. Y'all know how that works. All right, then this one is going to Kevin Mahan, same household. All right. Y'all can read it and quiz one another about it. Let's do a couple more of those. This one will be going to, well, none of these want to come into my hand. Here we go. Sarah Lang, all the way in the back. Tell you what, if you'll come forward, I'll just grab another one and call another name. And let's see, this one will go to Leanne Fannistel. Congratulations, Sarah. All right, you win one. By the way, raise your hand if you've won a book in previous Ember Lecture years. Right on. Okay, put your hand up. Raise your hand if you read it. All right, not bad, not bad. Raise your hand if you just lied to me. Uh, kind of. <laughs> Or just kind of fudged it. He was like, oh, I, I looked at it. You know, I looked at it. I didn't read it. All right, let's give a couple more of these away. Praying the Bible. Let's see. This one will go to Tracy Collier. Where is Tracy? All right, if you'll come down and grab this, I'll draw one more name. This one going to Donna Broom. If you'll just take this to Donna. Congratulations. And let's see. Uh... I want to give more books away. Okay. Let me pull one of these, one of these, and one of these. Let me tell you about this. This is actually a set. I'm going to give these away individually at the moment, but it's, it's a little trilogy of books written by a pastor in Kentucky named Greg Gilbert. Uh, one of these is titled, Why Trust the Bible? The white one. And then the red one is titled, Who is Jesus? 
And the black one is titled, What is the Gospel? So again, I'll give these out individually, but it is kind of a little set itself, and we'll probably give some bundles away uh, later on, so uh, that, that'll be fun too. Who doesn't love giving away a bundle of books? Uh, and by the way, I need to tell you all about these over here as well, so I'll do that in a minute. Okay, the first copy of What is the Gospel? by Greg Gilbert is going to the library of Heather Dickert. Heather, where are you? Come on down, if you don't mind coming on down. And then I'll go ahead and pull another name here. I'm making a mess on the front row. Uh, this one is going to Travis Nichols, a copy of Who is Jesus? I forgot which one I said. Which color you want? There it is, the gospel. Congratulations. You want the red one or the white one? There you go, fantastic. And let's do one more. I do think that this is the most, well, this is easily the most books we'll give away so far. Raise your hand if you're here for the first Ember Lectures. Do y'all remember that little stack? I was so proud of that. I was so excited. I was like, look, we're giving away stuff, and now here we are. Uh, oh, this one, this one, the copy of Who is Jesus? Going to Becky Presley. Becky, come on down. All right, while you're making your way down, let me start to explain what we have over here on the sides. Uh, so these I am going to refer to as backward book bundles. Okay, these are backwards, so you don't know what you're getting, right? unless you want to come look at the top one. Uh, but I want to tell you that God has blessed us in a way. So last year, last year we had a lot of giveaways, kind of like what you see right here. And that was, just, it felt overwhelming, and I thought, well, we'll have fun. We just had some extra money we could use toward it. And then I thought, well, we'll go back to that stack that we had had previously, which was fine. And yet the Lord had different plans, and I do want you to know that uh, we have a member of our church who had quite a substantial library uh, and offered to let the church uh, take it and, and decide what to keep and this or that. And so if you know Alan Vance, you can thank him. He approached me one day a few months ago and said, hey, uh, we've talked about this and, and we'd like to uh, offer the library to the church. And so about 4,000 volumes, we've been able to look through about 4,000 volumes. And some of them uh, we were able to give away. Uh, some of those we've got, I do want you to know, especially if you're a teacher, uh, if you enjoy studying things like that, we have started a little reference library uh, I don't know if you even know where our library is, but like if you walked through our library and kept going that back hall, there's another room back there, and we have now really what's become a little budding reference library, okay? So this past January, a year ago, in our library budget, we inserted some money because I said it's time to start buying some real quality commentary resources. Uh, and so we gave away uh, a set of these last year. Well, I bought a set for the library and some others. And I thought, well, that's just going to kind of kickstart us, and each year we'll add to it, because I want you guys to have access here to really quality resources. Uh, and then the Lord decided to kind of just shoot us forward 10 years with all the commentary sets that Alan brought to the table. And what we also have is many books that wouldn't fit in the right reference library. They wouldn't necessarily go all that well or needed to be in our library up front. And so we'll just see how the Lord continues to spread those around, and here's one idea, backwards book bundles. Okay, so what I'm about to do is the unprecedented, first time ever, backwards book bundle Ember Lecture giveaway. Okay, so you, whoever you are, you're about to make history. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull your name out. I'm going to pull your name out of the bucket, and you're going to come, and you're going to just pick a bundle. You can't turn it around and look at it. Don't cheat. The Lord's watching. But you're going to make history by picking the first ever Backwards book bundle. I will mess that up all month. Are y'all ready? Okay, I feel like I should pull this out of the teacher's bucket here. The first backwards book bundle of all time. Redemptive history being made. Kathy Truluck. Come on down. Come on down, Kathy, while we all watch you make your selection. Do not cheat. Just kind of, which, hey, I'm not going to tell you what to do. You just pick whichever little bundle you want. And I do want to thank, we had ladies that just came, uh, Ginger, Rob, and Debbie, anyone else that I may not know, they helped bundle those up and tie them. I did not do that, I assure you. Congratulations. Now, this is a perfect time. 
uh, this is a perfect time to say, let me remind you, just because I'm giving these books away does not mean I think you ought to agree with every sentence you read in that. Read critically, thoughtfully, okay? Uh, don't sue me uh, if you disagree with the book. If it's a book that you got from Alan's library, just sue him, okay? But no, think critically, all right? We don't necessarily have to agree with every single thing uh, that we read. And uh, I tell you what, let's do one more. Let's do one more backwards bundle here. This one is going to Tammy Bodie. Where is Tammy? Come on down. That's like winner's row right there. Where are you? Did you get it? Okay. Next time, everybody's going to see a bunch of, yeah. All right, pick your bundle. Congratulations. And uh, I guess I better not get carried away. We're going to be here all month doing this. So I'll go ahead and get back up there and we'll get back into it. Yeah, send that to Joey. Yes. All right. Okay, let's get back, get back into it. Now, if you have been following along kind of as best you can, you'll realize that we're just about at the very end of the book of Genesis and our story. So Israel has come down to Egypt. Jacob died, and eventually Joseph died. Even Pharaoh died. And then there would be a new Pharaoh that did not know Joseph or his family. But he did know that these Hebrews kept increasing greatly in his land, and he was intimidated by them. So this Pharaoh oppressed the people of Israel and turned them all into slaves. If you want to look at Exodus chapter 1, verse 12. We are told the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad, and the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. Pharaoh stipulated that all Hebrew baby boys were to be killed. In one of the Hebrew families was born a baby boy whose mother hid him in a basket like a tiny makeshift boat in the river. He was found by the daughter of Pharaoh who, drew, who named him Moses because she drew him out of the water. Moses grew up in Pharaoh's household, so the would-be slave lived with the ruler. As an adult, Moses saw an Egyptian beating up a Hebrew man, and he defended the Hebrew man and killed the Egyptian. But his murder was found out, so he had to flee. He went to Midian and lived as a shepherd for years. One day, as Moses was tending his sheep, Moses came across a bush that was on fire, but was not burning up. And there he encountered the very presence of God, who called him to go back into Egypt and to lead his people out of Egypt. How about you follow along as I begin to read from Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. God said to Moses, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Through the leadership of Moses and his brother Aaron, God charged Pharaoh to let his people go. Pharaoh refused over and over with his heart hardened. God had already determined this was how things would play out. He explained to Moses, and I'm reading now from chapter 6, verse 2, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, that's Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groanings of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves. And I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with the great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, 
And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. The Israelites struggled to believe in God's promises. And Pharaoh, who, by the way, we are told, was considered an incarnate God. So if you see, I don't know if you see those light blue colored books, just kind of a middle, a middle stack there, a book by a scholar, a scholar named John Salehammer. I'm going to use some of his information in this section. He points out Pharaoh was considered God himself, incarnate. So Pharaoh denied their freedom. So now it is on. God sent plagues. With these plagues, God would demonstrate to the people of Israel and the people of Egypt that he alone was God forever. Now, if you are taking notes and you want to see where uh, we see this is the reason that God did these things, let me just quickly mention Exodus chapter 7, verse 5. You want to write that down, Exodus 7, verse 5. Then jot down chapter 9, verses 14 through 16. And then chapter 10, verses 1 through 2. And by the way, I'll also say this. If you find yourself actually interested in having a copy of what I'm reading, just email me and I'll send it to you. In the first plague, God turned the waters of Egypt to blood. In the second plague, he overwhelmed the land with frogs. Again, Sailhammer points out the frog was deified as the one who gives the breath of life. With the third plague, God sent swarms of gnats, The fourth plague brought flies. In the fifth plague, the Egyptian livestock died. For the sixth plague, God covered the Egyptian people with painful boils. For the seventh plague, he devastated the land with hail. For the eighth plague, he smothered the land with locusts. For the ninth plague, he covered the land with darkness. Again, Salehammer offers helpful insight. He points out an intriguing return to pre-creation status, darkness. Then God threatened the final plague. He would bring about the death of every firstborn Egyptian son. God would protect his people, so he told them to celebrate what would become the Passover. And I want to invite you to turn with me. I'm going to go there in my copy of Scripture as well to Exodus chapter 12. Now, I I want to kind of warn you. uh, Some of you may not find this too surprising, but... There will be moments where we will read pretty big chunks of Scripture. Uh, This one here is just kind of getting us warmed up. I want to read Exodus 12, verses 1 through 13. I want you to follow along. I just want you to hear the account of the, the, the establishing of the Passover read out loud. Exodus 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. And I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, 
both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This Passover meal was to be an annual commemoration. So God's people will always remember how he saved them from their enemy and spared them from his destruction by the blood of the Lamb. After the last plague, Pharaoh relented. He released God's people who went with the treasures of the people of Egypt. After letting them go, Pharaoh changed his mind and chased the people of Israel with his army. God led his people right up to the Red Sea. They were stuck between the sea and the army of Pharaoh, but God led his people through the sea on dry ground. When they made it through, God covered the army of Pharaoh with the returning flood of the sea. Israel celebrated with a song. I want you to look at some of their lyrics. I'll be reading from Exodus 15, beginning in verse 1. Let's hear the lyrics of their song. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Just want to point out, it just seems fitting to sing when we want to celebrate that God is the one who saves us. Israel began to journey where God was leading them, and it was not easy. From the very beginning, there were challenges. The water was bitter, so God miraculously made it sweet. They became hungry, so he sent them manna. They got thirsty again, grumbling about their thirst. God told Moses to strike a rock, and water flowed from the rock. Israel was attacked by an enemy, Amalek, but as long as Moses' arms were lifted up towards heaven, they would win, and they eventually defeated their enemy. Now, a personal thought that struck me is I find it remarkable, a testament to God's power through his people, that a crowd, think about this, a crowd of recently freed slaves could defeat what was presumably a prepared and strategic army. Three months after the exodus, Israel arrived at Mount Sinai. God began to establish his former relationship with Israel, giving them the Ten Commandments. Then God called Moses to the summit to give him the various laws by which his people would maintain their relationship with him as their God and Savior. He planned to give them laws about altars and laws about slaves and laws about restitution and social justice and the Sabbath and festivals of celebration. He promised that they would conquer their enemies in the promised land. He gave Moses instructions for how to design their sanctuary, the tabernacle. In the tabernacle would be housed the Ark of the Covenant and the Table of Bread and golden lampstands, and the altar for sacrifice. He identified Aaron to begin the line of priests, men who would represent the people to God and would represent God to the people so they could maintain their relationship with holy God. While Moses was on the mountain, the people grew impatient. They demanded that Aaron give them a new God that would lead them on. So, In one of the lowest moments of history, Aaron had them collect all their golden jewelry and he burned it in a fire and he created a golden calf. Why don't you look with me to see what he says in Exodus 32 verses 4 through 6. Aaron declared, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. So here's what we have in this moment. Aaron, God's chosen priest, and Israel, his chosen people, celebrated the golden calf as their God. So they established an altar and a feast while God was telling Moses how to build the altar and how to conduct their feasts. 
God was ready to destroy the people altogether, but Moses interceded for them and begged him to continue with his plan of redeeming his people so that the nations would know that he alone was God. God sent Moses down to the people. In his rage, Moses threw the tablets to the ground and shattered them. And he destroyed about 3,000 men who were committing the atrocities of idolatry. Despite their rebellion, God continued in his covenant relationship with the people of Israel. The tabernacle was constructed. They made the Ark of the Covenant with the table and the lampstands and the altar of incense and the altar for burnt offering, the bronze basin, and the court around the tabernacle. They also made the clothing that the priests would wear while they were on duty in the tabernacle. When the tabernacle was ready, God's presence filled it. It was in and around this tabernacle, tabernacle where the people of God would experience the presence of God among them. And how about we look together at Exodus chapter 40, seeing how the book of Exodus ends. Exodus chapter 40, let's look at verse 34. Just try to, try to imagine this moment. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. And we find ourselves at the end of the book of Exodus, which sounds to me like a great time to give away some more books. Do you all want more books today? All right. There's only one answer to that question. Okay, let's see. Um... Let's see. Okay, yeah. Let me highlight this one here. Uh, there's a, kind of a little, a little pair of books here. I'll give these away individually. But um, Holman Publishers, which is like the publishing arm for our denomination, they have a very helpful book. I've given these away before. The Concise Bible Commentary. Does anybody happen to have one of these by chance? The Holman? Okay, yep. Got one another. Uh, this is fantastic, very helpful. It has very helpful material on every book of the Bible, some introductory material, and then just some very brief commentary that can kind of help you get going studying through a book. Uh, so in addition to the concise Bible commentary, they have also published, and this is something that I don't have personally, uh, the concise Bible dictionary. All right, so both of these are very, very helpful resources. I want to give these resources to our teachers. So let me go ahead and pull some names here. And let's see. This concise Bible commentary will belong to Aaron Goodwin. All right. Congratulations. Congratulations. You don't have to read that one this week or anything. It's pretty thick. Okay, and this concise Bible dictionary is going to go to Michael Day. You can stay right where you are, sir. Congratulations. Uh, let's see here. Um, if you'll bear with me for a moment. Amy, do you feel like introducing the women's... Okay, was that a yes? Right. Okay. We should have, I should have asked you before this, but... So, here, so here's the thing. This year we're doing something special here. We have, uh, we have a pile. All of you ladies, you have your name in this pink pile because we have resources that are only going to ladies. And I just want to say something and then I'm going to let you speak. We'll switch and you can speak real close to my cheek and they'll hear you. Why do you look like that? Okay, Betsy's going to save you. I can't even get my own wife to snuggle up with me in the microphone. <laughs> Randy wouldn't do it last year. We got to, okay. Uh, I, so I tell you what, uh, I, I believe this is one you've got some familiarity with. 
So why don't you tell ladies about this book, and then I'd like to also just say a few words to our ladies. So go ahead and tell them a little bit about this. Nice and close. You'd have been nice and close. I would have, yeah. I'll be... Word, and it's the byline. Um, How to study the Bible with both our hearts and our minds, and it's by Jen Wilkin, who, I mean, all of her books are amazing. But um, this is just such a good guide to how to dig into the Word um, and prepare to teach it well. Um, And it's very, like, I mean... I can do it, like I can read it, and I, you know, it doesn't take any kind of um, scholar or, you know, that, anybody. (laughs) That, oh, I'm on, I forgot I'm on. (laughs) The tiny books, that's where I was. Um, So the reason I was late was I was trying to finish the first chapter of that, and I'm like, how did that take me 30 minutes? So um, anyways, but it's just a really awesome tool. So if you don't get it mm. over the um, Ember well, Lectures time, I know you're saying wrap it up. No, that's um, not what I'm saying. Good deal. Uh, so if you don't get it, if you have a library card, um, and if you don't, go get one. But at Lexington and Richland, they offer um, Hoopla and Overdrive. You can have an account access to that. And I believe this is available on Hoopla, right? Audio? I know the audio is available on one of them. I listen to it first. So if you're like, I'm really busy and I I don't really have time to sit down and read a book, if you have the opportunity to put something in your ears or listen to it in the car, um, it's available. It will be free to you through your library. And um, she reads it, which is always fun. um, And it's so good. So if you don't get it, get it. And it's available through the library. I, it might even be available as an ebook. I'm not sure, but I know it's that on audio. Is. But you'll listen to it, and then you'll want to buy a copy, and then you're going to want to highlight your copy. So it, regardless, you're probably going to end up with wanting one. All right. so, do, do you want to draw the name, or do you want me to do it? We'll give away two of these tonight. You can be my Vanna. Uh, okay. Most this natural role. doesn't happen role, often. Most natural role I've ever played. Uh, this copy of Women of the Word is going to Elizabeth Hilton. Elizabeth Hilton. Come on down. All right. And then we'll, uh, we'll give one more of these as I try not to get tangled by my cord here. All right. And I would also just add, I, I looked over this one. It is good. And uh, you can find videos of Jen Wilkins uh, teaching. It's fantastic stuff. So this copy of Women of the Word will go to Kathy Truluck, living right. All right. She's apparently prayed more than you have today. So right on. Uh, and uh, Amy, how about you in just a minute pull some slips? I, I want to talk a minute about this set here. It's, and this has, will you mention the podcast? The, the, the Priscilla? It go yes, way. yes, it does. I'm glad you mentioned it. Okay, ladies, uh, let me say this, and I, I, want, I want this to stick with every one of you men. I want you to hear me say this. I feel God is, is doing something among some ladies in our church for the women, for our church as a whole, Raising up women who uh, will, will grow in studying and teaching God's word in a variety of ways. Listen, uh, we are all theologians, and we have come across some resources that I am very excited about. Did I do something wrong? Uh, oh, okay. You got turned off. All right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I do want you to know about this 
series. It's called The Good Portion. So ladies, go ahead and write this down. It's a series of books called The Good Portion. And there are uh, five books in the series. What I'm going to do is give away uh, individually the copies of this set. And then probably the last night, I'm going to give one lady the whole set. Um, So how about tonight, I'll give the first two away. And these are books on doctrine, and they are written by women for women. But I will say that I've kind of cheated and I'm going to get copies of my own, and I've read over the first one. But the, the uh, first book in the series is called Scripture, The Doctrine of Scripture for Every Woman. And this is written by a lady named Carrie Fulmar, who is the wife of the pastor of the United Christian Church in Dubai. And this type of stuff is very, very quality. So uh, this copy of Scripture, The Doctrine of Scripture for Every Woman, will go to... Anika Cornforth, congratulations. All right. And then the, the second book in the series is titled God, The Doctrine of God for Every Woman. And this is by Rebecca Stark, uh, who lives in the Yukon. Uh, actually, her, oh, and you mentioned the podcast. I heard her interviewed on a podcast. Ladies, let me also mention the name of a podcast, which I also am listening to. It's called Priscilla Talk. I, I would love for every woman to, to listen to at least two episodes of this podcast called Priscilla Talk, especially if you enjoy uh, teaching, studying scripture, things like that. Priscilla Talk, uh, they interview Rebecca Stark in this. This is God, the doctrine of God for every woman, and it is going to Marsha Rubino. Where is Marsha? Congratulations, Marsha. Okay. And, uh, and that's it for the pink bowl tonight. We're going to give more away each week. Uh, let, me, ooh, let me introduce you to another set that we came across at a conference. Uh, anybody know the name R.C. Sproul? Pretty well known. Yeah, I figured a bunch of people. Uh, so some the pastors and one of our elders were at a preaching conference, I guess in the fall, here in the Columbia area, and uh, of course we went to the bookstore, and there's this awesome little set of books that I looked at and thought, man, we have got to get some for my library and some for the Ember Lectures, and so we're going to give some away, and so I think what I have is two uh, complete sets here. I better make sure, yeah, I guess this is it, but it's got different topics in, in the titles of questions. What is the Trinity? What is the church? Does God control everything? Uh, What is the relationship between church and state? Why is there evil? How should I live in this world? What is the gospel? What does it mean that God is sovereign? Can I know God's will? Uh, Brief books that just cover big, helpful theological topics. Sproul passed away last year or two, I think. And so let me give a few of these away. Okay, this is a copy of What is the Trinity?, Uh, The series name, if you're writing this down, it's called Crucial Questions. It's the series by R.C. Sproul. This question is, what is the Trinity? This one is going to Barbara Wagers. All right, the Wagers household. They are big winners tonight. And let me go ahead and pull another name. Uh, This one is going to Ben Cornforth. If you don't mind taking this back to Ben, this one is titled, What is the Church? And then I'll give one more of these away. Uh, This one is the question, does God control everything? And this one will... One more. Good. (laughs) You got... (laughs) This is the Lord. No. We... I'm going to make some rules now. I'm going to have to make some rules. You can't do that to me. That that will scare a brother. The R.C. Sproul books that you just said, they're also available on Hoopla Audio. Okay, okay. If you want to look them up. Betsy, turn her off now. (laughs) Okay. That was alarming. It's like, what? You let your wife get involved, things get out of hand now. All right, does God control everything? This one is going to Robin Paycheck. Where is Robin? All right. Congratulations. All right. 
Let's do a couple more bundles here. You are welcome. Uh, backwards book bundles. Who wants one? Your hand went up so fast I should just give you one, but I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna, we're going to pull a name here. All right, this next backwards book bundle will go to Sheila Derrick. Sheila, come on down. And, and, and you don't have to stay on your side. You can just, whichever one you want, just don't cheat. You know, you just look and trust the Lord to lead you where he wants you. And uh, these are fun. To, all right, fantastic. Let's do one more. Let's do one more. This book bundle will go to Robert Tenney. Where is Robert? Come on down, Robert. All right. Go ahead and pick your stack of books, whichever one you want. Do y'all think we've made it through a fourth of the... No, not yet. I got one more. I'm going to give some more away here in a little bit. All right. Congratulations, Robert. Okay, what time is it? Okay, let's get going. Um, I'm on page 16 of 20, but uh, we're going to do a lot of scripture reading here in a little bit, so just kind of hang in there. As a reminder, if you need to go to the restroom, do what you got to do. All right, back into the story. Uh, when, when we finish Exodus, at this point in redemptive history, God gave Israel his laws. These laws included how to conduct burnt offerings and grain offerings and peace offerings and sin offerings and guilt offerings. He gave laws for clean and unclean animals and laws for purification and laws for treating leprosy and laws against eating blood and sexual immorality, etc. God instructed his people how to celebrate the Sabbath and how to celebrate the Passover and how to celebrate the Feast of First Fruits and the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Trumpets. He told them how to celebrate the Day of Atonement. All these festivals were reminders of who it was that rescued them and how he rescued them and that he was to be their God and they were to be his people. God promised blessings for their obedience, and he promised punishment for their disobedience. He instructed the priests in how to carry out the offerings in a way that would preserve his relationship with the people. I invite you to join me to Leviticus 16. We will read the chapter in its entirety. What I want to do, just as a reminder, and if you're new, the Ember Lectures are named that because... When life gets around a campfire and things just slow down to the embers, that's when you have your best conversations and you're just not wanting to be in a hurry. So let me remind you that when I'm about to read a pretty long chapter here, the Day of Atonement, uh, Leviticus 16, I want you to see what has been described by one scholar as the centerpiece of the Pentateuch. All right, so there's a claim that this is, this is the the fulcrum, the centerpiece of the entire Pentateuch. Would you follow along as I read Leviticus chapter 16? The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they drew near before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. But in this way, Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body. And he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering. And one ram for a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself. And shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats. One lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself 
and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself. He shall take a censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, and two handfuls of sweet incense, beaten small, and he shall bring it inside the veil, and put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony, so that he does not die. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. And in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel. And because of their transgressions, all their sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time he enters to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement for himself and for his house and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. And shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. And he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the people of Israel. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, and the tent of meeting, and the altar, he shall present the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel, and all their transgressions, all their sins." And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. And yes, this does sound bizarre. The, the idea of the scapegoat is what comes from this passage. Then Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and shall take off the linen garments that he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall bathe his body in water in a holy place and put on his garments and come out and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. And the fat of the sin offering he shall burn on the altar. And he who lets the goat go to Azazel shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water. And afterward he may come into the camp and the bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be carried outside the camp. Their skin and their flesh and their dung shall be burned up with fire. And he who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward he may come into the camp. And it shall be a statute to you forever that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves or fast. And shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you, and you shall afflict yourselves. It is a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated as priest in his father's place shall make atonement wearing the holy linen garments. He shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary. He shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. He shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. And this shall be a statute forever before you, that atonement may be made for the people of Israel once in the year because of all their sins. And Aaron did as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, I understand if it's one of those things where you just kind of got lost in all that, as what happened to me. But I want us to realize what we just saw is how God planned for his people to truly receive atonement for their sin through the priest. And maybe we'll spend some more time over the next few weeks looking at that and how it fits in the way that the rest of Scripture unfolds. So with the tabernacle constructed and the law instructed, it was time for God to prepare his people to enter the promised land. He arranged his army tribe by tribe. He told each tribe when they would march and where they would camp around the tabernacle. He promised he would lead them by a cloud during the day and a fire during the night. Whenever he moved, they would move. Whenever he stopped, they would stop. 
They would stay until he moved again, and then they would move. They had barely begun their journey to the promised land before they complained again. As far as they were concerned, God wasn't feeding them well enough. Feel free to turn to Numbers 11. I want to begin reading from verse 4. Numbers 11, verse 4. The people grumbled, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there's nothing at all but this manna to look at. God did not stop his plan. He sent them more food. He gave them quail in addition to the manna. But he also judged their grumbling. Look in chapter 11, verse 33. 33. We are told, while the meat was yet between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck down the people with a very great plague. Moses experienced opposition repeatedly. For example, his own siblings, Miriam and Aaron, opposed him. But they were confronted by God's holiness. Miriam was turned into a leper. They had to repent. Finally, Israel approached the promised land. Moses identified a team of spies. These men were instructed to go into the promised land where they spent 40 days secretly exploring the land and investigating the people. The spies returned, but they gave an unfaithful report. Look at Numbers chapter 13, verse 32. The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are of very great height. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. That was their report. Only two of the spies, Caleb and Joshua, encouraged the people to go forth with God to take over the promised land. Look in chapter 14, beginning in verse 7. They said to the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we passed through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. So the people rebelled. They refused to enter the land that God had promised them. God judged that entire generation. None of them would enter Canaan. They had to wander in the wilderness for an entire 40-year generation to disappear. The very children that they feared would die in the promised land had to grow up to become the next army who would go into Canaan. In their wandering, they continued to grumble and rebel. They complained about thirst again. And Moses struck a rock again. But this time, he did it in a way that displeased God. So Moses would not be able to go into the promised land himself. His calling would be to lead them up to the promised land, but no further. It became time to approach the promised land for a second time, this time with the new generation. King Balak heard the news of the people of Israel already defeating King Sihon and King Og on their way towards Canaan. Intimidated by the people of Israel, King Balak tried to defeat them by hiring a prophet, Balaam, to speak curses against the people of Israel. But Balaam could speak only blessings upon the people of Israel. So in the book of Numbers, there's this back and forth between Balak wanting Balaam to curse the people of Israel, but Balaam can't. God would only allow him to bless them. I want you to see just a sampling, but it's sort of the culmination of Balaam's prophecies. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 24. And I want to read verses tw- uh, verse 2 through 19. And uh, th- this just gives us a sense of it. I know we're just kind of jumping it right here towards the end of this episode. Numbers 24, beginning in verse 2. Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel camping tribe by tribe, and the Spirit of God came upon him. And he said, or he took up his discourse and said, 
the oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is open, the oracle of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down with his eyes uncovered. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your encampments, O Israel, like palm groves that stretch afar, like gardens beside a river, like aloes that the Lord has planted, like cedar trees beside the waters. Water shall flow from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt, and is for him like the horns of the wild ox. He shall eat up the nations, his adversaries, and shall break their bones in pieces and pierce them through with his arrows. He crouched, he lay down like a lion, and like a lioness, who will rouse him up? Blessed are those who bless you, and cursed are those who curse you. And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he struck his hands together. And Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, and behold, you have blessed them these three times. Therefore now flee to your own place. I said I will certainly honor you, but the Lord has held you back from honor. And Balaam said to Balak, Did I not tell your messengers whom you sent to me? If Balak should give me his house full of silver and gold, I would not be able to go beyond the word of the Lord to do either good or bad of my own will. What the Lord speaks, that will I speak. And now behold, I'm going to my people. Come, I will let you know what this people will do to your people in the latter days. And he took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is opened, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. Edom shall be dispossessed. Sarah also, his enemies, shall be dispossessed. Israel is doing valiantly, and one from Jacob shall exercise dominion and destroy the survivors of cities. It became apparent that God had equipped his people to do exactly what he said they would do. They would enter and conquer Canaan. While waiting to go into Canaan, they camped in the plains of Moab for their final preparations. To prepare them, God had Moses preach to them lengthy messages. And these are the messages we find in Deuteronomy. These sermons reminded them of their history with God and their wandering in the wilderness and their rebellion and God's grace and goodness and provision. Moses charged them with the law, reminding them of the Ten Commandments and the greatest commandments and various laws and instructions to maintain their relationship with the Lord. He called them to obedience by eating the right kinds of food and giving their tithes and celebrating the Sabbath and celebrating the feast and carrying out proper forms of worship. Again, God promised through Moses blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. Now, one more time, I want to ask you to join me in Deuteronomy 28. This is going to be a lengthy passage of Scripture that I want to read in closing. But if you have never read this chapter, I, I want this to be an eye-opening chapter for you. It is long, but like I said, this is, this is closing up the lecture. And then uh, more book giveaways. And then I've asked Randy Fanestel to close us uh, with a time to think about uh, people in the world who need to hear the name of Jesus but I want to read this moment from Deuteronomy 28 where God promises blessings for obedience and then curses for disobedience. Deuteronomy 28. This is what God said to his people. If you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God, blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall you be, shall be the fruit of your womb and blessed the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle and the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. 
Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your barns and in all that you undertake. And he will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a people, holy to himself, as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. All the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will make you abound in prosperity, in the fruit of your womb, and in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your ground, within the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasury, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you shall only go up and not down if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, being careful to do them. And if you do not turn aside from any of the words that I command you today to the right hand or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. Now, before we keep going, God is promising them layers upon layers of blessings. And now he shifts. And this is the long part of the chapter. If you're not familiar with this, just kind of hang on. Verse 15. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, Then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send on you curses confusion and frustration in all that you undertake to do until you are destroyed and perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the pestilence stick to you until he has consumed you off the land that you are entering to take possession of it. The Lord will strike you with wasting disease and with fever, inflammation and fiery heat and with drought and with blight and with mildew. They shall pursue you until you perish And the heavens over your head shall be bronze, and the earth under you shall be iron. The Lord will make the rain of your land powder. From heaven dust shall come down on you until you are destroyed. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. And you shall be a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. And your dead body shall be food for all birds of the air and for the beasts of the earth, and there shall be no one to frighten them away. The Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt and with tumors and scabs and itch of which you cannot be healed. The Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of mind, and you shall grope at noonday as the blind grope in darkness, and you shall not prosper in your ways, and you shall be only oppressed and robbed continually, and there shall be no one to help you. You shall betroth a wife, but another man shall ravish her. You shall build a house, but you shall not dwell in it. You shall plant a vineyard, but you shall not enjoy its fruit. Your ox shall be slaughtered before your eyes, but you shall not eat any of it. Your donkey shall be seized before your face, but shall not be restored to you. Your sheep shall be given to your enemies, but there shall be no one to help you. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people, while your eyes look on and fail with longing for them all day long, but you shall be helpless." A nation that you have not known shall eat up the fruit of your ground and all your labors, and you shall be only oppressed and crushed continually, so that you are driven mad by the sights that your eyes see. It's quite a bit, isn't it, so far? It gets worse. The Lord will strike you on the knees and on the legs with grievous boils of which you cannot be healed, from the sole of your foot to the crown of your head. The Lord will bring you and your king, whom you set over you, to a nation that neither you nor your fathers have known. And there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone. And you shall become a whore, a proverb, and a byword among all the peoples where the Lord will lead you away. 
You shall carry much seed into the field and shall gather in little, for the locust shall consume it. You shall plant vineyards and dress them, but you shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. You shall have olive trees throughout all your territory, but you shall not anoint yourself with the oil, for your olives shall drop off. You shall father sons and daughters, but they shall not be yours, for they shall go into captivity. The cricket shall possess all your trees and the fruit of your ground. The sojourner who is among you shall rise higher and higher above you, and you shall come down lower and lower. He shall lend to you, and you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head, you shall be the tail. All these curses shall come upon you and pursue you and overtake you till you are destroyed because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes that he commanded you. They shall be a sign and a wonder against you and your offspring forever because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart because of the abundance of all things. Therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and lacking everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the end of the earth, swooping down like the eagle, a nation whose language you do not understand, a hard-faced nation who shall not respect the old or show mercy to the young. It shall eat the offspring of your cattle and the fruit of your ground until you are destroyed. It also shall not leave you grain, wine, or oil, the increase of your herds or the young of your flock, until they have caused you to perish." It gets worse. They shall besiege you in all your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout all your land and they shall besiege you in all your towns throughout all your land which the Lord your God has given you. And you shall eat the fruit of your womb, the flesh of your sons and daughters whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege and in the distress with which your enemies shall distress you. The man who is the most tender and refined man among you will begrudge food to his brother, to the wife he embraces, and to the last of the children whom he has left, so that he will not give to any of them of the flesh of his children whom he is eating, because he has nothing left in the siege and in the distress with which your enemy shall distress you in all your towns. Did you catch that? The most tender and refined woman among you who would not venture to set the sole of her foot on the ground because she is still delicate and tender will be grudged to the husband she embraces, to her son and to her daughter, her afterbirth that comes out from between her feet and her children whom she bears because lacking everything, she will eat them secretly in the siege and in the distress with which your enemy shall distress you in your town. If you are not careful to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring on you and your offspring extraordinary afflictions, afflictions severe and lasting, and sicknesses grievous and lasting. And he will bring upon you again all the diseases of Egypt of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. Every sickness also and every affliction that is not recorded in the book of this law, the Lord will bring upon you until you are destroyed. Whereas you were as numerous as the stars of heaven, you shall be left few in number because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God. And as the Lord took delight in doing you good and multiplying you, so the Lord will take delight in bringing ruin upon you and destroying you. And you shall be plucked off the land that you are entering to take possession of it. And the Lord will scatter you among all the peoples from one end of the earth to the other. And there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your fathers have known. And among these nations you shall find no respite. And there shall be no resting place for the sole of your foot, but the Lord will give you there a trembling heart and failing eyes and a languishing soul. Your life shall hang in doubt before you. Night and day you shall be in dread and have no assurance of your life. In the morning you shall say, if only it were evening. And at evening you shall say, if only it were morning. Because of the dread that your heart shall feel and the sights that your eyes shall see. And the Lord will bring you back in ships to Egypt. A journey that I promised that you should never make again. And there you shall offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves. But there will be no buyer. 
Now, I know I, I took a bit of a risk reading that to you. I just couldn't help but wonder what it was like hearing that from God. You would think after hearing the list of blessings upon blessings upon blessings and then this, this extraordinary devastating list of curses and curses and curses, you would think, well, surely God's people will obey the Lord. Well, Moses read the law to them and they sang a song. Moses pronounced final blessings on Israel before they entered Canaan. And Moses died. And that's how the Pentateuch ends. Let's do a, after that lovely note, how about we give away some books? Uh, give away a few more books, and then after that, I'm going to ask Randy to come up. Randy, you're going to close us off.